Good morning. I hope you are well. I am so sorry. I have had been having trouble uploading the sermon from Sunday, um, and I think I have it sorted out now. Um, and so I pray you will enjoy this word today. And uh, before we get to that, let us pray. Mighty God, we praise and thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of just being able to be still and know that you are God. And we pray, Lord, now that as we come to the reading and preaching of your word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide and transform us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'd like to share from Acts chapter 2, verses 4 to 21. Acts chapter 2, verses 4 to 21. It reads, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I shall show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless to us the reading of his word. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As the apostles and their friends waited in the temple courts, three amazing things happened. There was a sound like a great blast of wind which roared through the house where they were sitting, the porch of Solomon. There also appeared tongues of fire dancing upon the heads of each of the 120 believers. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is the phenomenon of Pentecost, the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ, the beginning of the body of Christ. As we pick up the account in chapter 2, we learn the background of the amazing sermon which the Apostle Peter preached on that occasion. A mighty sermon that brought 3,000 people to Christ. We will look at part of that sermon now and the rest next week. It reads in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 2. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. 
Luke is very careful to describe to us the onlookers to this amazing miracle of tongues. It was intended for this certain group of people and they are described in one phrase. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. The time was following the Passover season during the 50 days between Passover and Pentecost. There were thousands of Jews present who came from all over the then known earth or world to Jerusalem at this holy time. They were pilgrims from all the nations of the then Roman world. They were Jews who had been dispersed from the land of Israel and had gone out to other nations of the earth. Many of them made an annual pilgrimage back to Jerusalem. God called them together in the most amazing way by the summons of a mighty rushing wind. When they heard the sound, the multitude came together. The sound that is mentioned here in, in verse 6 does not refer to the sound of tongues that would hardly be loud enough to attract the attention of the whole city and the countryside. But it is the mighty rush of wind that brought in the people from all over the city. It is the same word that occurs in verse 2. And suddenly a sound came from heaven. When they heard this, they rushed together into the temple courts to see what the sound was. It is almost as if God turned on a great siren, a wailing banshee sound, and thus called them all together. It did not require special, anything special in the way of supernatural activity to understand the languages. These pilgrims had come from all parts of the then Roman world and they heard them speaking in their own native tongues. That is what amazed them. It is important to note that Luke even names the localities and therefore the different languages that were being spoken. He begins in the east and lists a group of dialects east of Jerusalem, Posh, Parth Parthians, Medes, Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia were all toward the east. Then he moves north, including Judea, the very place where they were, the, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, which were all Roman provinces of Asia Minor, as we know it today. Then he moves south to Egypt and all the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene in northern Africa. Then west, Rome and, Cret and Cretans. Then again south, Arabians. For all these parts, men said, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Though they were speaking in different languages, they were saying the same things. What they were declaring was literally the, magnific the, 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 the magnificence of God. They were praising God. They were not preaching the gospel. They were speaking how great God is and they were telling him, telling him how great they thought he was. They were worshipping and praising God in these remarkable languages. This was the phenomenon that arrested the attention of the great multitude as they came pressing into the temple court. We also need to remember that these Galatians were fishermen, farmers, tax collectors. They never learned these foreign languages. They were only able to do this by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Notice the reaction Luke records of this crowd. They are first two words he uses for astonishment. They were amazed and bewildered. Twice he indicates that they were amazed. The word in Greek is a word that means literally to push out of their senses, to push out of their senses. It is exactly what we say when we use the modern phrase, they blew their minds. That's exactly what he said. It blew their minds as they heard this phenomenon occurring. And linked with that, Luke says, they were bewildered. Now, the word is not quite accurate translated here. It is really a word which means they were hit hard, stunned. They were staggered by this amazing thing. They heard these Galatians 
Galatian peasants speaking these languages and they were staggered by it, stunned by it, especially since they easily recognized the languages they were speaking. When the human mind is confronted with the new thing, it reacts in one of two ways, as in this case. First, they say to one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? That is, they began to inquire, what is behind this? What is the purpose of it? Why does this occur? That represents the group of open minds that are always ready to investigate further before concluding. Second, there was another group who immediately dismissed the phenomenon with the infantile reaction of mockery and ridicule. They looked at the disciples and said, yes, they're drunk. That explains it. They've been getting into the new wine. Thus, they dismissed it with ridicule. All this sets the stage for Peter's explanation. And in the next few verses, we have a wonderful message delivered by the apostle on this occasion. When the scribe looked at these men and women, they noted they were excited and articulate, speaking freely and easily and reacting rather strangely. It was not therefore unusual that they could come to the conclusion that they were drunk. But Peter says, no, you have the wrong explanation. The reason you're wrong is because it is only nine o'clock in the morning. So it can't be that they are drunk with new wine. They are drunk with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And when he quotes this amazing passage from the prophet Joel, it is important to note that in this quotation of Joel, there is no mention of, at all about tongues. It is, that, is that not strange? Peter says, this is, that this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. But Joel does not mention tongues. Instead, he refers to another gift of the Spirit, the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is the ability in power to declare the word of God, to tell forth the word of God. It will be manifested by young men and old men, even servants and obscure people. They shall be equipped by the Spirit to tell forth the word of God with power. That will be the mark of the age, he says. The emphasis is not upon tongues at all, not even upon gifts, but upon the Holy Spirit who gives these gifts age will begin peter says with the pouring out of the spirit it will end peter indicates by the sun being turned into darkness and the moon into flood finally what is the purpose of all these things the holy spirit is poured out on christians so that we may be empowered to transform the lives of unbelievers on the day of Pentecost, we have a powerful example of this. The Apostle Peter, as a disciple before the crucifixion, was no leader and he was no public speaker. If you can remember when Jesus Christ had a fish bride breakfast with the eleven after his crucifixion, death and resurrection, the Apostle Peter could hardly face Jesus because of his denial of him. Nonetheless, in a moment... That all changed when Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He preached such a powerful sermon that 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior that day. Today in the church we are so fixated on the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. That is, you are not an authentic Christian unless you can speak in tongues. I'm not too sure where this heresy comes from in the church. But we need to remember that speaking in tongues is a gift and not a prerequisite for a child of God. It is the Holy Spirit who decides. And we need to understand the manifestations are a means to an end. They are not an end in themselves. They are given for us for a purpose. For example, the gift of prophecy is given to bring hope to the children of God through someone interpreting and presenting God's word. The gift of encouragement is given to assist brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling, etc. Therefore, in conclusion, power 
can be used in at least two ways. It can be unleashed or it can be harnessed. The energy of 20 liters of petrol, for instance, can be released explosively by dropping a lighted match into the can or it can be channeled through the engine of a Nissan in a controlled burn and be used to transport a person 600 kilometers. Explosions are spectacular, but controlled burns have lasting effect, staying power. The Holy Spirit works both ways. At Pentecost, he exploded onto the scene. His presence was like tongues of fire. Thousands were affected by by one burst of God's power, but he also works through the church. The institution God began to tap the Holy Spirit's power for the long haul. Through worship, fellowship and service, Christians are provided with staying power. Remember, you are empowered to transform. You are empowered to transform. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, may we continue to open our hearts to you. And Lord, may we be your transformation agents in a world that needs Jesus, that needs hope, and that needs the good news. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May you have a good rest of the week, and may God bless and keep you. Bye.